I'm standing by the most famous dockside in Great Britain. It was from here in Southampton on April 10th, 1912, that the Titanic set sail for New York, never to return. During the course of the next 30 minutes, we'll tell you the real story of the Titanic, with the only film footage ever shot of the great liner, and also the only film footage of the aftermath of the tragedy. Film which was only recently discovered in a garden shed in Northamptonshire. Well, we're going now to the Midlands to find out how this important film of the Titanic was discovered after all these years. We're talking about old films, that was his life. I said, children, that Titanic film. She said, uh-huh. It might come in handy someday. Rini Mason found the lost film of the Titanic in her garden shed. Rini's husband, Archie, started as a trainee projectionist in 1913. Oh, we started when he was 13. And uh, well, he was showing films all his life until he was over 80. And that's how I met him, because I, I worked, he, he showed films at one cinema, and I played the violin for the silent pictures in the other, that's how we met. He, his, his cinema's in one street, and my cinema's in with another, and that's how we met. And I heard about the um, film they're making in America, Titanic, I oh, wonder where that whole film is. So I said to my son David, um, have a look in the shed. I said they kept all his old stuff in the shed. No, he searched, he searched, no, he said he must have got rid of it. Well, I didn't think he would. He, he liked it too much. And I thought, well, so I could have another look. I couldn't find it. That was on, on a Saturday. I went to bed. Woke up in the night, well, half asleep and half awake. and. I heard this voice saying, it's in the shed. It's in the shed under the bench. Oh, I thought to myself, that's funny. I woke up, I got up ever so early in the morning, Sunday morning. I thought so I'd better go and have a look in, under the bench in the shed. So I got on my hands and knees, all in the dust. <laughs> and I was just room for my hand to get an arm to get under on the floor. And I started one end and it was had nothing and I reached right up the very end at the corner. I felt something and dragged it out and it was a film tin. Of course I didn't know if it was a Titanic film or not. So I brought it out here, I got a knife and ever so rusty and I eat it all the way around with a knife. So it took me a long while to get it open but I gradually got it open and there was a film inside in perfect condition. After 86 years it had been in that film tin. And I took it in the house and I weren't sure then, but uh, I, I held a bit up to the, to the light and I could see we are sinking and I could see a ship and I knew it with the Titanic film then and I found it. <laughs> After all those years I found it. We're now going to study these remarkable film sequences in detail. This footage is some of the most important film taken in the Edwardian period. It shows the Titanic at Belfast during the final stages of its fitting out at the Harland and Wolf Yard in the spring of 1912. These shots represent the only moving images ever taken of the liner. Within a few weeks, the ship would be complete, ready for its journey to Southampton and the fateful maiden voyage. Whilst in the fitting out berth, Titanic had some alterations to her promenade deck. This followed experience with the first ship, Olympic, which had ended service the previous summer. These are the actual ice flows the Titanic tried to negotiate on the night of April the 14th, 1912. 
Stretching some 60 miles long and 12 miles wide, many other vessels in the vicinity that night were stopped in their tracks by these perilous conditions. For some reason, the Titanic ploughed on at over 20 knots until one of these huge bergs appeared at the ship's bow. Some eyewitness reports put these icebergs at between 50 and 200 feet high. It only needed one of them to rip through the hull of the White Star liner. Come quickly, distress, was the emergency message sent from the Titanic by wireless operator Phillips after the collision. This coded radio signal was the forerunner of the SOS, better known today. In fact, Save Our Souls was transmitted by the Titanic that night in a desperate attempt at locating a rescue ship. These desperate calls for help would haunt Captain Smith all the way to his watery grave. Captain Smith is seen just ten months earlier on the occasion of the maiden voyage of the Olympic, which he also commanded. He was just 61 years of age and had a distinguished career. He's seen dressed in his summer whites, as White Star's most senior captain, he was reputedly the highest paid on the North Atlantic run. News began to spread around the world about the liner's sinking, and naturally many people crowded around the White Star Line offices in New York, London and Southampton, anxiously awaiting reports. These scenes are of the offices in Lower Broadway, New York, and whilst an employee attends to the cleanliness of the building, relatives desperately wait for news of loved ones. Many Americans were on board the ship that night. Many would not return to their beloved country alive. The saviour in all this tragedy was the little Cunard liner Carpathia, which was on its way from Halifax to the Mediterranean at the time. Itself trapped in the ice flows off Newfoundland, the 13,000-ton ship risked all to get to the scene of the disaster. Altogether, the Carpathia rescued 705 passengers and crew from the Titanic's lifeboats as dawn broke on April the 15th. It took four and a half hours to get everyone on board for the three-day journey to New York. Ironically, the Cunard Line and the White Star Line merged a few years later. The Carpathia was sadly lost during the Second World War on active service. As the rescue ship steamed to New York, members of the press assembled to catch every storyline they could get. A certain amount of checkbook journalism, without doubt, took place. The Mary Scully was commandeered to meet the Carpathia off Long Island. The world was waiting for the real story, as, up to now, it was not clear how many had survived. Once the Carpathia had docked, the real scale of the disaster unfolded. Over 1,500 had gone down with the Titanic, including its captain and designer. The rescue ship attracted a good deal of attention that day. As well as the 705 extra passengers, it had over 700 passengers who had to contend with a journey back to America. Note the telegram boy, desperate to get his face known to the camera. He bought a telegram for one of the survivors. The crew of the Carpathia would have thrilling stories to tell for many years to come. These are the berths at the Cunard docks, where, just the night before, 30,000 had gathered to get a glimpse of the survivors disembarking from Carpathia. Just along from here, at Pier 59, a space had been booked for noon on Saturday the 20th of April for the maiden departure from New York of the Titanic. Many of the survivors left from these quaysides for their return to Europe, with their plans to live in the new world at an end. As New York mourned, 
its citizens brought spare clothing to the docks, indeed anything to comfort those men, women and children who'd lost everything. These scenes portray an Edwardian New York with the women wearing the dress of the period. At the time these films were taken, cinematography was just 15 years old. The Titanic saga was the first incident of its kind to receive attention from the new moving image cameras. There were many heroes in this disaster, but none more than Captain Rostron and his crew of the Carpathia. He was knighted soon afterwards and died in 1940 at his hometown of Southampton. Father Hoag is reported as being one of the first people to spot the Titanic's lifeboats as the Carpathia neared the scene. He quite probably held services on board the rescue ship for those who perished. These are sequences of the actual crew rescued from the sea. Their faces tell the story they had lived through just 72 hours before. Many of the crew would testify at the inquiries held in New York and London to determine the cause of the tragedy. The inquiry in New York began the day after the survivors arrived in the city. This is quartermaster Robert Hitchens, who was actually at the wheel of the Titanic as it hit the iceberg. He was to turn his wheel quickly to starboard by order of the first officer. These are more than likely the crew of the Carpathia, illustrating to reporters how Titanic's crew and passengers adorned the important life preserver belt. Here is Italian-born Marconi after giving evidence to the Senate investigation. It was his wireless radio invention that helped to save so many lives that calm, cold night on the North Atlantic. He and his wife very nearly sailed on the maiden voyage themselves. Oddly enough, the Titanic sailed past his home along the banks of Southampton Water. The grim task of collecting bodies from the sea was given to the cable ship Mackay Bennett. She left Halifax on April the 17th for the four-day passage to the scene. The makeshift coffins are stored on the deck. Captain Lardner and his crew picked up 306 bodies, a third of which were buried at sea. Nothing remained of the ship Titanic. It would be 72 years before she was seen again. I'm joined on this quayside in Southampton by Milvina Dean, one of only two English survivors of the Titanic who are still alive. Milvina, how did you come to be a passenger on the Titanic? Well, we were emigrating to Kansas. Uh, my, my, my father had a public house in London and was told by his relations in Kansas there was more opportunity there, so he decided to emigrate to Kansas. And we weren't supposed to go on the Titanic, we were going on another ship. But because there was a coal strike at the time, and all the coal was needed from the maiden voyage of the Titanic, and they asked him if he'd like to go on the Titanic. So of course, he was delighted. In the years which followed, did your mother recount details of the tragedy to you? The little my mother spoke about it, she never said it was awfully bad or anything. And she sent a card home to my grandmother in the forest, saying everything is fine up to now. She sent that from Ireland, from Queenstown, and everything is fine up to now. It sounds really a bit ominous, doesn't it? Did she, in the years which followed, did she recount to you what had happened on the Titanic? Not until I was eight years old. And then she was going to get married again, so thought that she'd better tell me about it. So all she said was, the night it happened, uh, we were all in the cabin, and my mother and father, they heard uh, a crash. And my father said he'd go up on deck to see what had happened. He went up on deck and said, apparently the ship has struck an iceberg. Get the children out of bed and up on deck as quickly as possible. That's what my mother did. They never stopped to think the ship was unsinkable, as some did. And we got up on deck, with, I think with the help of a sailor. And my mother was saying goodbye to my father. And he said, hope to see you later. And got into lifeboat number 13 
because I was small, I was put in a sack over the, and put over the side and I put number 13. And my mother didn't realize that my, I had, well, my small brother was there as well. She didn't realize that he wasn't with us until she, they were rescued by the Trapezia. And when I think back, as a child, I can't remember my aunt, uncle, or anybody saying anything about it. I just knew I was, I was brought up me thinking my grandfather was my father because he made so much fuss of me. And of course, I didn't know my father. So, well, things went on, I imagine, pretty normally. I mean, my, I remember my mother having those dreadful headaches. The effect on Southampton was devastating. More than 500 people, mostly crew, would not return. Whole streets in some quarters lost a male member of the household, creating social problems for many years. Did your family get compensation from the White Star Line? Well, yes, they, they paid for our schooling, and, and my mother had a, a, a pension. But whether that pension, pension still went on when she remarried, I don't know. You've never seen this much acclaimed film? I had it, yes. no. Tell me why. Well, because first half would be okay, but the second half, no. When the ship is uh, going down and the people are panicking, jumping overboard, I wonder what my father would be doing. Although I didn't know him, I still think about him. You've been a celebrity now for a great many years, but would you say that, that this film, the release of the film, The Titanic, has increased your celebrity status as a Titanic survivor? After the film came out, oh, it became hectic. It became much too much. My phone was ringing all day long. People wanted me to go here, there, and everywhere, and have interviews, come to see me. Oh, yes, it was awful the first couple of months, say, because I didn't have any peace at all. I got quite tired of it all, because it was too much. Storekeeper Frank Prentice was plucked from the freezing sea by lifeboat number four after it returned to the scene. Of course, she was a fine ship, 46,000 tons, four funnels, one was a dummy, but um, they had four. They were buff color with black boot topping. She was about 900 feet overall, 90 feet at midships, we had 16 lifeboats, eight on port, eight on starboard side. The lifeboats were fully loaded, would carry 50 passengers. And when you come to think that we had 2,300 on board, the lifeboats didn't carry too many. They were, they could carry, if they'd been fully loaded, 800. The whole tragedy of the sinking of the Titanic was speed. That was about all, the only thing they thought about was speed. And we were doing 25 knots from the time we left Queenstown. And the morning of the 14th, we knew and uh, we knew there was ice. There was ice all over the place, but nobody seemed to. I suppose they did care a bit, but I don't know. We had the designer on board, Andrews, and we had uh, Bruce Ismay, the chairman, who lost his job over it because I think it was through him being on board that we were out to break that record. Then uh, things began to happen, and uh, she was gradually was taken in water, and she was gradually listing over to port. Then I thought, well, I don't know, there's something very serious now. And the, then we had orders to get the boats out, and all the lifeboats were swung out. And I might tell you that the distance from the lifeboats to the water was 70 odd feet and then we had orders to uh, women and children into the lifeboats she gradually sank by the head and you could feel everything going through her rumble rumble everything movable was going down she gradually um, she went down and she came up and she was almost vertical out in the water and uh, I climbed, the, we, there were two boards aft keep, which said keep clear of propeller blades. And I, hung, I was hanging on to this, waiting to drop in. You couldn't see the water, we were too far away from it. 
I had a life built on. I let go, and I, as I passed, I saw the two propeller blades looming out of the water. And when I hit the water, if you hit it with a terrific bang, knocked all the wind out of me. I was very lucky that I didn't hit anything in the water because the wreckage was all round the stern, and there were, oh, I think, nearly 100 people all round the stern too. The most senior officer to survive was second officer Charles Lightoller, who had to swim for his life as the ship went down. 32 years later, during the Second World War, he saved 122 soldiers from the beaches of Dunkirk. Second officer Lightoller from a radio interview in 1937. That ship was the Californian, and though her lights were plain to everyone on board the Titanic, she seemed to pay not the slightest heed either to our wireless calls or to the distress signals we were firing every minute. The reason why she didn't answer our wireless calls, which other ships heard halfway around the earth, was because she only carried one wireless operator. And when we struck the iceberg, he'd just gone off watch, so it was no fault of his. But why no notice was taken of our distress signals, shells that are fired hundreds of feet up into the air to explode with a cascade of stars, heaven only knows. More film has recently come to light of the Harland and Wolfe shipyard at Belfast. Here we see Titanic's elder sister, the Olympic, under construction. These fascinating scenes show exactly how they built the world's biggest liners. These important sequences were filmed from the laying of the keel in December 1908 until the launching in 1910. Olympic would receive the close attention of the owners and the press, being the very first of the new Leviathans. The Olympic was the brainchild of Bruce Ismay, chairman of the White Star Line and Lord Pirrie, chairman of the builders, Harland and Wolfe. Their scheme was to produce a two-ship service across the Atlantic, giving their passengers the sheer opulence of the Edwardian period. The ships were the first in the world to pass the 40,000-ton mark. They would be the first to offer a la carte restaurant facilities and items such as elevators between decks. In all, the two new ships would cost three million pounds. So big were they that the yard at Belfast had to firstly build new slipways before their construction could begin. The huge gantry dominated the skyline of the city. At over 850 feet in length, new quays had to be built in Southampton to accommodate the liners. In New York, the authorities were a little slow in preparing themselves for this new breed of passenger ship. These important scenes show the Titanic sister gradually rising towards the sky, with the huge hull plates being lifted in for the riveters to begin their deafening work. In less than four months, a second keel would be laid down, that of a ship destined for disaster.
This rare archive film has survived remarkably intact, its rusty tin helping to preserve the nitrate material. By the autumn of 1910, work on the liner's hull was complete and she was launched into the water amidst great celebration. Work would now proceed to finish the liner off, ready for her maiden voyage in the summer of 1911. Titanic would get none of this attention at its launch a few months later. If the cameraman had panned just slightly to the left, he would have glimpsed the Titanic in the throes of construction. With the foresight of cameramen from the early part of the 20th century, we've been able to get a glimpse through a window on the past at the legend of Titanic. One thing is for certain, this legend will continue well into the 21st century.